Deputy Director of the Department for Continuing Education at the University of Oxford and academic affiliate at the Bonavira Institute of Human Rights. She is the Vice Chairperson of the Board of Trustees of the Universal Rights Group. She has authored a number of academic and UN publications, uh, including the Oxford University Press publication, uh, Freedom of uh, Religion or Belief and International Law Commentary. And her main research has centered on UN protection mechanisms, freedom of religion or belief, freedom of expression and women's rights. She is also the author of Women and Religious Freedom, Synergies and Opportunities. Welcome, Nazila. It's really great to have you on the panel. Uh, our second uh, speaker is Nala Haidar El Adal. She is the vice chairperson of the UN Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, namely CIRAW. She is also a commissioner of the International Commission of Jurists. She has over 30 years of professional experience, mainly within the United Nations system in various capacities both at headquarters and in the field uh, ranging from social development to humanitarian assistance, to peace building and to human rights. She holds an LLM in law from Pantheon Sorbonne and a law degree in international law from St. Joseph University in Beirut, Lebanon, as well as a license in sociology. I call upon you, dear participants, uh, to provide specific questions and not to hesitate to raise comments uh, in order to have fruitful deliberations. Our technical team will share uh, with me the questions and comments uh, that uh, our distinguished experts uh, can uh, respond to uh, them. Now we proceed uh, with our speakers and uh, I give them a uh, floor in two rounds. In the first round, they will have a chance to in introduce their positions by mostly focusing on challenges. And then we will have another round uh, for five, seven minutes where they talk. Uh, uh, they will talk about the opportunities, uh, recommendations and good uh, practices. I suggest uh, we uh, try to uh, limit ourselves with 15 minutes, dear panelists. I uh, would like to give the first uh, word uh, to Dr. Nazila Gena. Uh, dear Naz, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Oder, and uh, thank you very much to the guests. As you will no doubt find out, um, I'm the warm-up act, and then you get the wonderful comments by uh, Nahla Haydar, who will also connect it much more uh, to the grassroots and to uh, what can be done, and she's fresh from CEDAW committee itself, so uh, we couldn't have a better uh, participant. I will try to stick to the idea of uh, starting with uh, the challenges and then uh, the opportunities, but since I have a slide and since I'm going through the legal framework, um, I want to lay out the normative terrain. Um, and, you know, if I was giving this presentation to um, my country of origin, which is Iran, there would be a lot of frustration with it because uh, many in Iran would not consider that there is any way that women's rights activists and freedom of religion or belief activists can at all collaborate. But as uh, Nahla Haydar will say from the, the CEDO level and from her um, regional and national experience as well, there may be opportunities here which we will get to, but there's no doubt that there are many challenges and this is a new terrain. Um, I will, uh, when I talk about women's rights, we will be mindful of the fact that women's rights has been understood and interpreted to include all gender equality. So excuse the, uh, you know, if I refer to it, it's because it's in the UN language, but let's proceed and explore this idea of freedom of religion or belief and gender equality. Are they vastly different legal and normative frameworks or is there any connection between the two? Um, this, area is not new in terms of the literature, but the literature, uh, the academic literature at least, has been focused on particular issues, you know, cultural challenges and women's rights, headscarf issues have been quite dominant, looking at particular minorities, for example, in Western countries, and gender equality and freedom of religion belief per se is fairly new in the academic um, literature. A number of years ago, I produced a uh, a document that explored this arena, and I'll be drawing some slides uh, from that. 
let's just start with the basics. And that is that international human rights are the birthright of all, regardless of our sexual preference, of our gender, of our orientation, of our race, of our religion, or belief, or non-belief, uh, race, place of origin, etc. Um, there are numerous human rights committees, uh, commitments rather, that have been um, adopted by states around the world, and they are legally bound by those standards, even though we often observe them in the breach. And these rights that are often violated, but are part of part and parcel of those commitments, of course, include women's rights, gender rights, freedom of religion or belief. The other important point is to note that all, all human rights, I know this is something of a mantra, but all human rights are universal, interrelated, interdependent and indivisible. And something that perhaps we have not explored sufficiently is the interrelatedness of freedom of religion or belief uh, and, and gender equality uh, and how we can maximize the enjoyment of both of these. So when we look at the sources of, of the standards in terms of freedom of religion or belief, of course, we find this captured in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, in uh, regional human rights instruments, and of course, in national constitutions and laws around the world as well. From the beginning, it was clear that freedom of religion or belief was for, is for everyone. And the scope of it is not, you know, as I heard in a conference last week, still people talk about the three heavenly religions. And yes, you know, I, I'm not questioning that uh, they are heavenly um, and, and that's not a human rights critique in any case, but, but really it's about thought, conscience, religion and belief. And it was always there from 1948, from the outset, that the scope of that was broad. Um, this includes change of religion or belief, which may have implications for, you know, marriage, divorce, inheritance, custody, all of those matters. Um, and also the fact that that faith, uh, religion or belief can be manifested, including with others and in public. Um, we find it's uh, legally enshrined in the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And then, of course, from that stems um, the inspiration for many uh, articles in regional instruments, constitutions and laws. We have the interpretation of Article 18 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, which again emphasize that the protection can be for theistic belief in God, non-theistic, those that don't believe in God, atheistic, um, those who reject God. Uh, so all those religions or belief can enjoy protection under Article 18 uh, of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. And there's a special emphasis in this interpretation of the standard by the UN Human Rights Committee, the, the treaty body that has oversight over the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, just like the treaty body that Nahla Haidar serves on uh, has oversight over the UN Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women. But there's an emphasis here that where the challenge comes from national law, the constitution or the majority, then the burden on the state is even, more, even stronger to ensure protection. There, sh there, shall be, there should be the, no impairment of the freedoms under Article 18 or any other rights, regardless of who is the majority in power, what is the state religion, and so on. If anything, there's even more importance to ensure enjoyment of others, and the state must do more to ensure that. The question of gender equality and freedom of religion or belief has received attention also in the mandates of the UN um, Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion or Belief. And these are three reports. Uh, actually, you will see that they became stronger, <laughs> not least because, you know, <clears throat> we're talking about a gap of 18 years, but also they stood on the shoulders of one another and became, um, you know, Ahmad Shahid's report, which is just from last year, was consultative. It was, there were consultations around the world and, and you know, it's much more detailed than the initial um, and worthy effort that Professor Amor made. So, for example, uh, and we should note that the, the, the mandate of the special rapporteur, the instruction to, the U, to these UN special rapporteurs on freedom of religion or belief, 
is to consider gender equality as well in their activities. So they're not separable in that sense. That rapporteur on freedom of religion or belief must consider um, uh, gender equality, and they have done so, and uh, their reports reflect that. Now, we have looked very briefly um, in five minutes at freedom of religion or belief in international law. Um, and we're going to be just as brief when we look at gender equality and, and Nahla will pick up the pieces <laughs> um, and, and remedy it. But what about women's rights instruments at the international level? What do they say? Now, women's rights instruments, uh, the, the normative standards themselves, do not mention freedom of religion or belief, the human right to freedom of religion or belief. Where we find the word religion, rather than freedom of religion or belief, um, it's kind of subsumed under concerns uh, around customary and traditional practices. And so it only rears its head as religious practices that are harmful, rather than as there is this freedom that is for everyone and that coexists and should be maximized alongside women's rights and equality and gender equality. So whereas freedom of religion or belief instruments and the reports of the special rapporteurs have been more nuanced in their language, for example, they don't say violence from religion, they say violence in the name of religion. Why? It's not like being politically blind to it. It's not giving it the credence of saying that it really is from religion. If you say it is, you're actually giving it more power and possibly more popularity, right? So maybe, uh, that language is more helpful. And we should always be mindful of Article 5.1 of the ICCPR and its equivalent in European instruments and other instruments, that nothing in a human rights treaty can and should be interpreted um, uh, in a way that destroys other rights. Why? Because of indiv indivisibility um, uh, of all rights. The, the human rights are there to reinforce one another and to be enjoyed as a whole, not for one right to extinguish another. Um, so it, the reference is, uh, we say in the CEDAW instrument, it, sorry, in the women's rights instruments, it's sometimes looking at religion as culture or tradition and with a specific focus, understandably, on violations and harmful practices. So, um, you know, behind Article 2 is a concern about religious practices that are harmful uh, to women. Yes, it talks about prejudices, customary and other practices that are based on the idea of inferiority and superiority. Sometimes um, these are in the name of religion. Um, similarly, in Article 5, a very strong um, an important provision specifically in 5F, states have the duty to take all appropriate measures, including in legislation, to modify or abolish existing laws, regulations, customs and practices which constitute discrimination against women. We cannot shy away from the fact that that is often reinforced or may be reinforced in the name of religion. Now, um, I, I would encourage us all to uh, be critical about what is religion um, and uh, whether religion really, if, whether it is in the spirit of that religion that there should be such violations, but we really don't have time to go into it. Um, what we are not getting into in these instruments is the energy, the inspiration, the strength, the camaraderie, uh, that women do draw from religion or belief in a way that also empowers them. But since we're focused on violations, we give that less emphasis, not because it's not the case. So really, it is the harmful practices that we are seriously concerned about. And the interesting thing is that it's very recent that UN treaty bodies have also suggested that even in arenas such as harmful practices where violations may be in the name of religion, there is an important positive role for, for example, religious authorities to try and counter these harmful practices. Perhaps we'll get into that more in the discussion. 
but the challenges remain and uh, you know there are special rapporteurs treaty bodies that constantly have to raise issues that and violations that are carried out in the name of religion some of these that we see through the treaty bodies are fgm uh, child marriage or forced marriage um, polygamy um, stoning burning of widows dowry related violence etc there's also the feminist reading that we can benefit from, from CEDAW and feminist movements around the world that can shed a light on our understanding of freedom of religion or belief. From those movements uh, and those insights, we know that the public-private divide should not be a barrier towards recognizing violations where they occur, regardless of whether they are in the private sphere or not. We should be mindful and very vigilant regarding the violations that are carried out um, against gender minorities or women. And we should include um, the representation and voices uh, of these, uh, these people in the drafting, understanding, interpreting and application of the law. So if we bring women's experience more into uh, forb discriminate freedom of religion or belief, the question is what does coercion look like for women or gender minorities? Um, in terms of the lived reality, do women have access to get their violations heard and addressed? Can women and sexual minorities interpret their religion or belief in accordance with their conscience, a conscience that is at the core of freedom of religion or belief and this human rights? Can they manifest according to that conscience and understanding? The, the idea is not that we go and save these victims, but that they, they themselves are able to understand, to discuss, to consult, to share, uh, and to enjoy their human rights fully. So two things to take away. I have spoken primarily about human rights instruments and therefore a freedom of religion or belief as protected as part and parcel of those human rights. Um, my discussion has been less on religion as such, but even when violations are in the name of religion, Perhaps this is the time, it is timely that we should be able to bring that in as part of the solution. There are many questions that remain, but I should stop here. Thank you so much, uh, Nazira, for this insightful introduction. Now I pass the word to Nala. Nala, please Thank you. take the floor. Thank you very much, Professor Oder. And really it's difficult to follow from Nazila. She said it all. I will try still to give the perspective from the CEDAW experience and I'll make it a little bit more um, concrete. When I joined CEDAW, I considered myself in terms of freedom of belief as a secular person. So I thought that most of the problem comes from the religious side for women's rights. That was my firm belief as individual. And of course, it was not surprising for me to notice that from the nine core international human rights treaties that Nazila alluded to some, the most reserved one is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women. We live in the 21st century, and yet the idea that women are human beings of equal worth and dignity to man was like a radical notion. I joined the committee in 2013. So for me, it was really very difficult to, con to look at religion as a positive, I'm telling you about my own process and experience and how I discovered freedom of religion and belief and how I became part of the thinking that uh, Nazira was describing, because we, if we want to effect change, we cannot turn a blind eye. So it was not surprising that 440 reservation that was entered against Sidao, among this 440 reservations, 60% are based on religion. So it's not only Islamic context, but mostly Islamic context, we have to, have to confess. But 60% of the reservation are based on religion. And the most reserved article of the convention is article 16, exactly as Nazila was saying, which is the one about equality between men and women in marriage, family relations, custody, et cetera, inheritance, et cetera. It, was, it is the most reserved provision of all UN human rights treaties. So when we look at the country that have reservation, 
57 of the countries are organization of Islamic cooperation. And 28 had entered reservation, uh, almost all of them from the Middle East and North Africa region, South and Southeast Asian region. And those that ratified the treaty with the reservation, not only reserved whole or part of Article 16, but they have also a sort of blanket reservation that is almost uh, contradictory to the purpose of the convention. Because they would say anything that is incompatible with Islamic Sharia. And we all know there is not one single Islamic Sharia. There are so many interpretations. Then they say, out of respect for the sacrosanct nature of firm religious belief, which govern marital relations and which may not be called into question. Or we are in a situation where Islam is the religion of the state. And these countries have ratified a convention that states very clearly the importance of not only the, the, the juro equality, but the factor equality, substantive equality. So it looks like a little bit we're dealing with schizophrenic situation. I realized after a year or so, the committee, that we need to engage with religion from a rights perspective, to bridge the gap between religion and rights and break the hegemonic belief that faith and women's rights are opposed to each other. And we can't turn our back on women who want to remain within their faith, but want the right to be respected. So we have been very much helped by civil society organization who have been doing a lot of research on these issues because we were refusing to enter into dialogue on religious aspect because of lack of knowledge, lack of argument. We were not able to answer state parties sometimes. In the, in the, in the, in the constructive dialogue, when we raise these issues with governments, they go out of their way to say they cannot reform the discriminatory provision in their personal status law. Um, and, and in fact, these do not constitute discrimination. They are more a sort of complementarity of rights between men and women. Remember what happened with the Tunisian constitution on the issue of complementarity of rights. However, some governments do acknowledge discrimination, but they are smarter. They claim it's not them that do not want to change these discriminatory laws, but it's culture, customs, and tradition that prevent full implementation. They, can they tell us very often, the people are not ready for change. And that they claim that they must listen to the voice of the community. And uh, some of the government with substantive Muslim minority population tell us they will not make any change without community initiative and consent. So can you imagine in, the, and in order to preserve harmony uh, in, in, in within the multiracial or multireligious country, can you imagine what does it mean for, for countries that have multi-legal systems that we're not even talking about men and women equality. Among women, there is no equality in the, in the, uh, in the status of, of their uh, personal life. They get married. Or, or they can uh, have be custodian of their children. Some others cannot. I mean, I'm talking from a country that has 17 community and that is proud to be diverse like Lebanon. But at the same time, we have not been able to build a movement of citizenship because we are managed by 17 different laws. So based on that, I started to look more and more carefully at the freedom of religion and belief. And I was very lucky because this is in that context I got interested and I met Nazila and I met the special rapporteur. I learned a lot from both of them because the Office of the Human Rights of the High Commissioner understood that it cannot continue to do as the UN did for decades, turn back on religion, not want to enter into discussion on this like if it is a hot potato. And they have launched this fantastic process that, that led to this initiative where we call Faith for Rights. Uh, and, and which is built around exactly the two articles that Nazila was referring to, 18 of the Universal Declaration and 18 of the ICCPR, and which has 18 commitments uh, based on you know, dialoguing with, with faith leaders, et cetera. And one of these commitments, it's not a coincidence, it's number five uh, because of SDG five as well, is to ensure non-discrimination and gender equality particularly regarding harmful stereotypes and practices or gender-based violence. So this has opened a lot my eyes because I met many, many faith leaders who are amenable to discussion, to reform, to understand, to interpret. So 
the reservation and explanation and justification of member states for non-compliance, they are in fact, in my view, politically motivated because they fly the flag of religion when it's convenient and it makes their life easier because they don't pay attention really to faith leaders. They don't listen, they don't try to build the bridges. And the only way to, for us to advance on this agenda was to document ourselves, was to get the kind of knowledge, let's say for instance, on Islamic legal knowledge, to work with NGOs that have done research, to work with scholars and to be able to answer from within. So freedom of religion and belief was an eye opener for me. And I was lucky to be part of several of the activity that the Norwegian had organized on this issue because it has strengthened my belief that this is from where we can effect the change. And we were used to tell the, the member states at the very beginning of me joining, your reservation are contrary to the object and purpose of the convention, remove your reservation, reform your laws, but we didn't have any substantive suggestion on how this can and should be done. Now with this ability to interact with the freedom of religion and belief initiatives around the world, and the Faithful Rights Initiative of the Office of the High Commissioner, we feel that we are able to register position that we are listened to because we are illustrating with example, how did Morocco do on this? How this polygamy was interpreted this way? How this happened in another context? And we are showing the best practices and we are showing it's possible and we are not taking no for an answer anymore. And I think it would be interesting for those of you who are interested, who like to look at, um, at the concluding observation of CEDAW to look eventually at the one on Turkey and the last dialogue. The, the new dialogue is soon up uh, for, Turkey is soon up for dialogue. I think the, the, not the next session, the session of February. So it would be interesting to look at what was said at the time of the last dialogue in 2016. But also I'm so pleased to be with you today in particular because this is the 1st of July a sad date in a way for Turkey because of the withdrawal of the Istanbul Convention, a convention that carries the name of one of the most beautiful city in the world. Uh, and we in SIDA were very concerned about the, the intention to withdraw of Turkey. We had a dialogue with the, with the, with the um, permanent mission uh, that did not lead to any change in position. And I know that how much the civil society in Turkey is mobilized, has been mobilized and is trying we are hoping that the parliamentary process will lead maybe to something, maybe, uh, but I can, I'm very happy to, to, to say, and this can be shared because it's public document that we issued yesterday evening ahead of this uh, effective date of the withdrawal of today, a special statement that I would like everyone who's interested in gender equality to look at because we were expecting really uh, Turkey, which was a model in a way on gender equality in the past, not to completely have this regression. And because we are still hoping that there is a possibility that since they are a member of CEDAW and the core obligation are still in CEDAW, that we will be monitoring the issues with, with, with relation to the gender-based violence and the increased feminicide that we hear about in Turkey. And that is a source of concern and that is not justifiable under any faith or any belief. Thank you, I'll stop here and maybe we can take questions and come back later. Thank you again. Thank you so much, uh, Nala, for all those enriching comments uh, as regards having an answer from the within. And thank you so much for sharing the recent developments as regards the CEDAW statement uh, regarding uh, Turkey's withdrawal from Istanbul uh, Convention uh, as the Turkish participants uh, are fully aware of the fact that there is an ongoing legal process right now. Uh, however, uh, the Turkish Council that's at the highest administrative court has released uh, a few uh, uh, hours ago uh, a new decision uh, as regards the rejection of the interim uh, relief. Uh, the, ah. court, the court rejected actually uh, the suspension of the presidential decision. Mm -hmm. However, there is an ongoing uh, legal yeah. process. The final decision, uh, the judicial decision has not been delivered uh, yet. And there are ongoing protests right now in Istanbul. Okay. Uh, thanks, thank you so much. Thank in, you. In <laughs>
In the second round, uh, I pass over to Nazila uh, for her comments as regards good practices for recommendations and other issues. Um, thank you. Well, we're speaking to 71 of you, <laughs> and uh, I'm, you may be from different backgrounds and, and different sectors. Uh, and I think perhaps Nala and um, my message uh, to you that we share with you, Professor Oder and Mine, um, Mine Hanon, is, uh, is the same. If we are lawyers, we can be vigilant uh, and do pro bono work in this arena and to be mindful that when religion is raised as a barrier, uh, the discussion has not ended. Um, there is the letter of the law and there is the spirit of the law in legal studies, but also in religion. Uh, in, in that way, they are very similar. Um, and the spirit of the law uh, is to enhance um, individuals to live their lives fully and to flourish. And surely the spirit of religion is also a spirit of love, of understanding, of compassion, of respect. Um, and we also have to be mindful from a religious perspective. Do we want blind obedience to a law or do we want it to come from, to spring from love and commitment? Um, so all of those shape um, the understanding of lawyers. And I think if Seidel was able to stop from being religion shy in advancing its objectives. Um, we have examples from regional to um, national jurisdictions. Um, an example is from the administrative courts in Egypt, which for some time was denying IDs uh, to those who, who had changed their religion uh, from Islam to Christianity or the Baha'i faith. Um, and what the administrative court said is that we can't do anything about this. Uh, only Christians and Jews um, will be and Muslims will be recognized in this country. And our, our IDs cannot be given to anybody else. When Human Rights Watch went in to challenge this, they too were religion shy and they were going to only make human rights arguments. Uh, but they decided that since the language that is the challenge to them is not only in the name of the law, it's also in the name of religion. So they collaborated with the Egyptian Institute of Personal Rights and actually in their submission, they brought up religious arguments from Islam as well as legal arguments. So let's get over our religion shyness in advancing respect and compassion. And uh, when you look at the faith for rights, you look at the Beirut declarations, there is, there's even a small distillation of religious texts, of holy texts, of language that um, seems to enshrine the spirit of the law in the language of religion. And of course that is, uh, has a huge reach. If we are civil society actors, um, let's put away these, these strong barriers between feminists and religious actors at the national level, if at all possible. And you know, there's the precious point of unity that we can discover in any challenge. And from there, we can gradually collaborate. Um, and similarly, academics are increasingly giving attention to this, and um, may we wish them well. Nala, please take the floor. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, um, I want to give just an example, um, maybe that can um, uh, clarify a little bit how, how the kind of challenges uh, that we have. Very often member states tell us that uh, the treatment of men and women, as I said, is a reflection of complementarity of rights uh, and that they want to do that to protect the family. And, and so the man provide and protect the family and in return, women obey them. And they say this is reciprocal obligations, not discrimination. And it's meant to maintain harmony and balance. But of course, they do not go on to state that if men fail to provide and protect, they do not lose their rights and privileges. While women who provide and protect their families, as is the reality today, do not enjoy corollary privileges in law and practice. They still remain the inferior half. So who is sensible, sensible to this argument? Faith actors because they know that this is, there is an uncertain injustice. So engaging with them 
and talking to them and uh, trying to address through the, the, uh, the better understanding and reforming some of the laws is yielding results because there is a big change. I mean, we are always between two things. Very often member states also uh, try to make, render us more radical by uh, always depicting uh, religion with the potential of uh, extremism. And, uh, and because they are the barrier against extremism, because they this and that and the other. But we have had experiences in country where uh, the dialogue with the, with the faith actors uh, has led to very serious legal reform. I want to cite very much Morocco here because I have accompanied Morocco since more than 20 years in all the reform. Now, I'm not saying that the implementation is perfect. There's still a big gap. But this is a country that has main, main of its sources that comes from Islam, but comes from other legal sources, and that has given paramount level to the international treaty. This is another area that is very important. Under FOB, if the state permits that the, the superiority of the international treaty, then there will always be ways to found to put uh, every interpretation under those uh, commitment made under the international treaty. This is the second thing that I have noticed uh, personally, to which uh, uh, there is a lot of, um, you know, um, um, uh, of attention, is when women take the floor on their own rights from within their faith. This is a very strong, um, a very strong uh, um, conduit for change. Because women usually, uh, at least in Islam, were, were not allowed to be scholars. And now we have many of them that are feminists, but they are persons of faith. And we have also, for instance, in certain countries, because I don't want to demonize only Islamic society. Religion is a problem also in several Latin American countries where a right for abortion is not uh, permitted. Uh, also under the church, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm not, I'm maybe using the Islamic uh, example from Islamic context because we're talking about Turkey who had been a secular country for decades and who may have faced now some difficulty in some, uh, you know, um, regression in certain areas as we have noted, unfortunately. So I think that um, engaging uh, uh, religious leaders from a right perspective, from within, the heart and the spirit of the religion, as Nazila was saying, I believe very, very strongly in the importance of talking about the genuine objective, the respect of humanity, the respect of equality, the respect of dignity. There can't be a, a genuine faith person who would not be sensible, sensitive to these arguments. So we need to continue dialoguing and working and seeing what kind of progress we can make together Otherwise, we will be condemned to certain type of rejection of the freedom of religion and belief and thinking that we can solve everything only with the human rights system. And we have seen it has been there for 70 years, the Universal Declaration, and the treaties have been there for more than 40 years, and they didn't solve because at the very first two, three decades, they ignored those other actors. And now it's really time for a change. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, such a thought-provoking uh, comment, uh, Nala. Now I open the floor for discussion, comments, and the questions, and I would like to kindly share with you some of the questions uh, that have been shared uh, by our participants. Uh, how can the right to freedom of religion or belief help us uh, to deal with the political abuse of uh, religion? Nazila, okay. would you like to address this question? <laughs> uh, yes, certainly. Uh, well, we don't get a direct reference to the political climate or the dominant power relations in human rights law. <laughs> I guess the idea of, of law and international human rights law as well is that this will be another source of power and protection in society. Um, freedom of religion or belief, normatively at least, I'm not saying in practice, um, not only in the text of uh, article, well, first of all, article 18 puts everybody on the same level. This is a right of everyone, children, women, minorities, majorities. 
uh, those that are considered mainstream, those that are not considered mainstream within that co community of religion or belief. Um, then it also gives certain guarantees yes. that there should be no coercion, there should be no impossible pressure on you when it comes to matter of religion or belief. Okay, so that is um, absolutely um, impossible for a state to reserve or reject. This is part and parcel of the freedom. It's only in the manifestation of religion or belief that there can be legitimate limitations under strict conditions. And we need to be grateful for that because otherwise anything goes in the name of religion. But this too is a protection for, for us. It's, it's giving a space for religion or belief, but it is not saying that everything is legitimate and uh, without limitation, just because somebody's dog is joining us, they're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but any action, uh, especially if it infringes the rights and freedoms of others, then that is not a legitimate, it, it can be limited by, by the state. And indeed, in certain conditions, it should be limited by the state because it is uh, infringing the rights and freedoms of others. But for more detail, please look at General Comment 22 of the Human Rights Committee that interprets it much strongly. In one sentence, if there is a dominant religion, if there is a state religion, that state has more responsibilities and a specific duty to ensure, to guarantee, and to show that there is no violations and no discrimination, let alone violations. There is no discrimination against others. Let's say there is a Zoroastrian majority state. Um, it needs to illustrate that non-believers, Muslims, Christians, Jews, Baha'is, Buddhists are not being discriminated in any shape or form compared to the Zoroastrians of that state. Okay. Thank you very much. Now, I have a question to both of you. Uh, women or groups who interpret religious sources in a way that is compatible with gender equality can be targeted in society from politicians or other leaders. Do you think that if women's right to freedom of religion or uh, belief, if protected better, for example, in the area of interpretation of religious sources, this could contribute to advancement of gender equality? Okay. Nala, would, would okay. you take more? <laughs> Thank you. I, um, I think personally that uh, uh, women human rights defenders in general be it uh, women of faith or other, are really, really vulnerable to all sorts of, of reprisals. And this is, for me, one of the biggest challenges uh, in, in, in the area of women's rights, how to reinforce that ability to express, to research, to communicate. We have every day, uh, you know, sometimes killings uh, of women who are working on the environment, sometimes, uh, you know, jailing of women. So we, we, uh, I think that the scholars will face the same risk if they are coming with a spirit of reform. So the best way is to ensure that uh, these are um, monitored very, very closely and that there is an international support to activism and to scholars who are able to speak truth to power to contribute to the reform process. And I think that without women as scholars, there cannot be a sustainable change in the interpretation. Because, uh, the, you know, don't speak about me without me. This is extremely important to increase the, the, the, the, the number of women who are able to answer um, from within, from the text. I have seen that, for instance, with one NGO that we, we work with very closely that was really instrumental in shaping uh, the change within SIDAO because of Article 16, as I mentioned earlier, that is Musawa. They came with, with the studies, tables, uh, they came, what is the fiqh, what is the sharia, what is sacred, what is, a, uh, you know, what is uh, something that we are authorized to, to amend, what is really the sacrosanct, that everything for them was sacrosanct. And then we, al-fiqh, and we started to, to disaggregate everything. Oh, yes. And we found that this is a possible way of moving forward with uh, religious leaders and with the state party. So I believe we have a collective duty to protect these women and ensure that, uh, that their objective on gender equality 
is uh, is uh, remains the guidance for for for for their activism. Thank you. Okay. May I come in? Yes, yes, yes, sure, sure. Please jump yes, into conversation. Very, very briefly, um, yes, freedom of religion or belief says we have the right to um, have, adopt, change, manifest religion or belief, and that includes teaching, observance, worship, and practice. So certainly our observance of a particular religion or belief, you know, the text doesn't Im become embodied in us automatically and magically. Hopefully it stimulates our soul, but it doesn't happen automatically. It comes through us. And by doing so, we also have understanding, you know, uh, the God that some believe in also gave us a mind. So that process of understanding and interpretation and application is just part of it. Let's be fair minded and say that there are faith based organizations all around the world that do incredible work and have done so for centuries and no doubt will do so in the future. But that doesn't mean it's a trade off that we that violations are OK because they are charitable activities. Both are important. And we are saying that the faith based actors and also religious minorities uh, and uh, people who in an ideologically very authoritarian state suffer. We are talking about protecting and enabling the flourishing of all of those. Another interesting question uh, to, to our speakers. We understand that states have an obligation to protect against harmful practices what about the practices that do not amount to harmful practices? For example, in some religious communities, women are not allowed to be religious leaders, imams, or priests. How does freedom of religion or belief address this issue? Mm. Mm. This, perhaps we can step back from this and look at it as a question of strategy and human rights change. There is always the opportunity of a robust confrontation. Um, there is also the caution of not intervening from outside um, because we are aware that it might not be helpful. So Nahla has been continuously talking about discussion from within, dialogue from within, but also dialogue between peoples of different faiths, ideologies, religions, or belief. You know, we have um, we, we have to also, the state has to guarantee, create a, a, a, a bubble, minimum guarantees and safety nets for all of us, irrespective of that. So they're also, um, as Nahla was saying, just the religion, uh, sorry, the, the state can't step back from these practices and say, I have no duty here. Article five of CEDAW says precisely the opposite, that where you confront a serious cultural challenge, you need to address it as soon as possible and robustly. But for me and you, do we jump in and we protest or do we sometimes enable and dialogue? It depends on the issue. Nala, would you like and to comment yes, on? Yes, yeah. yes, on this point as well. I think we are uh, seeing a change um, uh, in uh, several areas also in respect to women, uh, you know, guiding a prayer, in respect to women um, uh, scholars or teaching theology in certain faculty. Uh, so we need to continue push and ask for more. And I think that uh, maybe this is a good point you're suggesting, Professor Omer, for me, under Article 7 and 8, uh, maybe in the future, we, do, we, we just don't simply ask them whether they are in the diplomatic and in the judges and in the police, but we will ask them also whether they are in the, in the religious leadership. I think this is a very valid point for Sidal. I'm going to take it with me. And next uh, dialogue in October, I will see uh, which context, which country, and, and raise it to see if first if, they, if it, is, it is acceptable and if they enter into dialogue on these issues and how much the state is responsible and how much they delegate to the religious leader. Because this is also a game. Very often state parties say, we can't do it. It's the religious leaders. We've given them everything, which is not very true. So we would like to be able to get a certain number of um, uh, the statistics and data on how it happens in certain country. We know, for instance, in Indonesia, several things have been progressing in this direction. So um, I'm, not, I'm not pessimistic. I think uh, we can go in that direction and increasingly get the results. Thank you. Okay. 
Uh, another significant question as regards strategies or coalition building activities, how can religious actors and gender equality actors work together to enhance both of these rights? Just one, yeah. just one example is the Faith for Rights initiative that mm -hmm. Nata spoke about. And under its umbrella, they have had trainings. There is a trainer, yes. a trainer manual that, you know, has two parts of it. One is the, the, a select, a, you know, a very, very select distilled um, inspiration from different texts, from different religions and beliefs around the world. And the other is, uh, you know, a, an initial effort of those inspirations speaking to human rights and um, committing to human rights. It's for me and you, it's not just for people who have a position in a religion or even an NGO or faith-based organization. And perhaps you'd like to look at it. It's the beginning of, of this bridge and an opportunity. And you know, it, perhaps it needs to be nuanced for different parts of the world, or you would uh, have a different selection of holy texts to, to be able to speak to the minority or majority communities where you're at. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree with Azila that this has proven to be a very useful tool. We have had peer-to-peer -peer learning several webinars uh, since uh, the pandemic. And every time I find that uh, this initiative is really helping to create coalition, to build bridges, and it's bringing a lot of spirituality into the, the implementation of the 18 commitments. So I would invite you to look at, uh, I can send the, the website to, uh, to um, yeah, I can send you the website and you can look at it because there is also a lot of footage of, uh, of uh, poetry, of a lot of spirituality, uh, and in particular on the 18 commitments, but also on commitment number five. I spoke personally more than once uh, on commitment number five, which is the one on non-discrimination and gender equality. I think this is a good, uh, a good platform for, for inspiration and for networking. Mm -hmm. So there was a question as regards faith for rice, uh, and I assume that it has been uh, answered. There is a question uh, uh, as regards secularism, and this question uh, can be answered by Nala. Is secularism a sort of tool to protect human rights, especially in Muslim world? Yes, this question um, is explicitly yeah. for you, Nala. Yeah. yeah. Freedom of religion and belief, as we said, a tool take into account non-believers, secular believers, as, as Nazila was saying from the beginning. I personally uh, consider uh, that uh, secularism is one way of um, bringing all the citizens under the same umbrella. This is Nahla individual perspective because I originally be, I'm a secular. It's not that I don't want to dialogue with religion, but I find that when I look at my own country, with 17 personal status for uh, for like 4 million people. You know, I don't know where I, if I've ever seen the day when women and men will be equal, because as I said, women are not equal among uh, themselves. So I think if we leave that to the private sphere and everyone worship the way they want and everyone is free, et cetera, but we have um, a, a, a minimum of codification that is secular, that brings uh, women citizens at the same level of rights, I personally will feel more comfortable. Not only in Muslim city, I think in Western city where there is a certain relative success in gender equality, it's not top notch, but there is relative success. It's because of a certain secularism that has you know, uh, put everyone under the same uh, rule of law. So it's not the, the but this is a personal uh, view because of a personal lived reality in my own country. Okay, thank you so much. Another question uh, for both speakers. Uh, some organizations have some restrictions on dress codes, uh, particularly as regards uh, headscarf, which is named as a dress shall not reflect the religious belief of the employee. Do you think this is acceptable? Hmm. 
I, I did a study about this, uh, looking at equality and discrimination on the basis of religion or belief in England and Wales. And, you know, sometimes it really goes uh, in a very nuanced way to the exact facts of a case. So one case was uh, prohibiting a woman from wearing a headscarf because she worked at the hairdresser. And that was rejected by the court because just because you work at a hairdresser doesn't mean your hair has to be uncovered. Uh, there could be other reasons why your hair is covered or other uh, instances in which you may be wearing a, a, a head covering of one form or the other. But another one was the case of a teacher who worked with language for newly arrived migrant children. And she was wearing the niqab. And I'm sure we've all been in the situation of learning a new language where you do a lot of lip reading. And in that case, uh, it was upheld that that restriction was legitimate. And if she couldn't take off the niqab when she's with those young children, then she can't do the job. So in, a, in a, a context where there is equality before the law, where there is a fair justice system, it really would go down to the precise facts of a case. And these are some instances where it may or may not be upheld. Of course, the reality in many other parts of the world are blanket bans um, or blankets, mandatory, um, headscarf, etc. Now there uh, are some, from, uh, okay, oh, please take the floor, Nala, sorry. No, for, from my side, I have to say, when I was a very, a sort of integrist secular, I was against the scarf uh, in schools, uh, in particular where there was this debate in France. And then one day my daughter stopped me and said, she had a friend at school who in Switzerland who had a scarf. And she said, with your position, do you think Shadia should not go to school? And that hit me very bad because the Shadia uh, told me that it was her personal choice. So then that was the, the integrist the secular that I was and I learned not to be anymore. So I would be like Nazila looking on, on the issues and uh, whether this really prevent them from performing uh, the right. But it's, if it's a choice, if it's not imposed, I think it should be respected. If it's a choice, I still have doubts sometimes when I'm chasing adolescent girl, if this is really a choice or under influence. I have, I'm struggling with that. I'm speaking candidly. Okay. Now uh, we have two questions uh, formulated in Turkish. I would like to raise these questions in Turkish and our translators uh, will provide. <laughs> Onlar e, çeviri aktaracaklar. E, böylelikle kendi dilimde konuşma fırsatı da verecek bana dinleyenlerimize. E, good evening e, for you all. We do have two Turkish questions and with your permission I would like to share them all with you. E, the first question is for Nazila Gena. E, Turkey withdrawing from the Istanbul Convention is... E, as a practice that is done for the name of religion, or should it be accepted as an act uh, done for religion or with the pressure imposed by the religious groups? Should it be perceived that way? How do you approach the issue? How do you perceive the issue? Thank you. With, with all due respect, I would uh, really welcome Nahla speaking to this. She's just been addressing the issue at CEDO and who am I to speak in front of her? and. In fact, so many of you, I'm sure, are much more up to date uh, and aware of the, the details. Nahla, please. Well, uh, uh, the Turkish Dele, uh, mission in Geneva, never, uh, when we discussed with them as Bureau of Sidao, the withdrawal, they never said that it was because of clash with religion. They never said that. They simply said uh, that they found um, in the written answer, that, they, that, that there were references in the text of the convention that was not exclusively on women. And I think we know exactly what they are talking about. I think they had a problem with the LBTI uh, references to LBTI uh, and sexual orientation. And we know that uh, in fact, the word sexual orientation has never been approved by many, many, many, many states. And there is now um, a gender identity. And there is now even a backlash on the issue of gender identity. And we are paying very much attention to come back to women and girls, right? Uh, so that we don't get sacrif sacrificed in, in the middle. 
but uh, they never mentioned religion as being the reason. They, uh, they simply said that certain groups uh, do not belong there and that uh, they don't want to remain linked to this interpretation of the larger groups. And they didn't mention them uh, explicitly, but uh, we know exactly that they were talking about uh, um, sexual minorities. E, i̇kinci Türkçe sorumuz da e, şöyle, İslami feminizmlerin yaygınlaşması... How about Islamic feminism, which has become widespread out of religious reasons? How about exclusion of women and LGBTI individuals? What is your take on this? And in addition to that, some circles are marginalizing um, Muslim feminists. They're trying to depict, the, they're trying to discriminate against them. Uh, Nala, would you like to respond to this question? Yeah. By the way, this question is accompanied by a paragraph of comment. Let me read it out. This comment is about a criticism against the Turkish religious uh, national authority. In our secular country, we have this national religious Islamic authority who claim they represent the religions in Turkey, but they have uh, they exclude certain segments in the society. And this puts LGBTI individuals and some segments into a difficult uh, position. Nahla, it's over to you. Let me repeat the question again. Islamic feminism it has become widespread. And how does that link with the exclusion and discrimination against women and LGBTI? How about Islamic feminism? Can it be helpful for our discourse? What is your take on this? Thank you very much. Well, I have read several um, paper research and um, from Islamic feminists, um, maybe more in Southeast Asia than in the Middle East where um, there is a reference, a historical reference, even to the prophet time on homosexuality and the fact that it's back, back, uh, part of the, of the social uh, tissue of, of, of our societies. So I don't uh, think that there is no possibility to the contrary from those research and from those quotes that I uh, found uh, where there is acknowledgement of, uh, uh, of LGBTI, um, maybe not to LGBTIQ, but homosexuality in a broader sense, uh, historically, I think that, uh, that this is where we need to, to, uh, to have more dialogue on the, these, uh, ten, these uh, minorities so that we don't um, render them invisible, that we protect them and that we um, acknowledge that uh, they have made different choices. And I don't think uh, that the religious authority in Turkey, I think it's more the political religious authorities. It's about very much, as I said, religion is used as a political tool uh, in that context that was very, very clear uh, because this was already a presidential decree. It didn't come through the normal processes of uh, withdrawal that could have should have gone through committees in the parliament, et cetera. The processes were, already um, uh, you know um, flawed so um, I think this is the, what we hear there is much more a political discourse to support a political decision and it's uh, populism in a way I mean uh, let's face it it's, um, it's it is a, a populist decision uh, the, to please a certain um, certain groups who have uh, difficulty in acknowledging the specificity of, uh, of these minorities. Can I just add a word that the first word in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and a word that comes up constantly in human rights instruments is everyone. Everyone should enjoy non-discrimination. Everyone should enjoy equality and the rights contained. Um, the LGBTI movement, rather than try to create a new treaty or start a drafting process, they went the the, the method of reading it into the, the existing instruments. And you see from the link, the Yogyakarta principles from 2006 that were updated um, nine years later. And these recognize the rights of LGBTI within existing instruments. And I would commend you to look at it. 
Um, there's also very briefly, when the mandate of the uh, rapporteur on sexual orientation was adopted, uh, I happened to be there in Geneva. It was very interesting. The organization of Islamic conference and therefore, you know, the state members of that organization um, said that they would not cooperate with that mandate holder, but several of them, nevertheless, the states took the podium and they said that there should be no violence against LGBTI. So even if they didn't fully recognize and decided not to cooperate with this mandate, they neither blocked it and they were at some pains to, to say that there should not be any violence against LGBTI persons. And it's worthy of note and it's a, um, you know, important to um, remember that. So the states had made a decision, at least that there should be no violence. Uh, another question uh, for both speakers uh, from LGBTQ uh, perspective, how from a policy uh, perspective do we reconcile apparent conflicts between religious freedom and human rights? This appears to be more intuitive when considering traditional gender inequalities, uh, male, female binary, but how are LGBTQ issues considered in this framework? How should essentialist principles in various faiths to be addressed or rather either affirmed or dismantled? I can uh, recommend uh, that they read the two last report of the current Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Religion and Belief. I think all of it is said there, correct Nazila? Absolutely, there was a lot of consultations around the world and many organizations that sought to address precisely this question were consulted and active um, in, in you know, this, uh, these reports taking shape. So um, Ahmad Shahid's uh, 2020 report on gender equality is an excellent starting point. Uh, I, I think we, there's also you know, the questions of interpretation, the questions of do we charge in and dismantle or do we enable dialogue and give space for discussion? Those are strategies in different contexts. We've had panels in Oxford. Some have been um, largely sort of Western dominant LGBTI organizations saying, even 15 years ago, they were saying, well, if there is no recognition of marriage equality, there is nothing. That's the bottom line. Uh, whereas we had students who were working in Philippines, in Kenya, in different parts of the world saying, no, we work priest by priest, we work organization by organization. These are stepping stones towards progress. So, you know, that strategy, strategy depends on your terrain and needs to be informed by your reality. And the final uh question relates to the good examples of religious institutions and societies. Could you, uh, could you please further elaborate on good examples from religious institutions and societies uh, regarding uh, striking the right balance between gender equality and the freedom of religion or belief? I could uh, come back to what I said about Morocco because I think one of the strength of that country is that it recognizes its roots from Judaism to other cultures, to African, to North African in the constitution itself. And although the, the king is the leader of the believer, commandeur des croyants, as we say in French, he has made enormous uh, strides of uh, um, uh, law reform, uh, Islamic law reform, in particular aiming at uh, more gender equality. Uh, again, I say there is a gap between the text and the practice, but the law, the legal reform in itself is titanic. It's, it's, it's immense. So um, there is a, when there is a will, uh, he has surrounded himself with scholars and, uh, and has been able to follow through. And of course, as a king, um, the, these were not questioned. Uh, his decision were uh, translated into legal frameworks. Now the gap between the, the rural area and the cities is, is, is very big, but at least we have a point where we start from. This is a good example. I think there are some other positive example in the Tunisian experience that I know of, uh, but I cannot illustrate in uh, very specific. Uh, and um, some also, again, um, some in Indonesia, 
uh, came across uh, where we see that um, if there is a political will and commitment to law reform in Islam, it is possible. Nazila, would you like to comment on this? Issue? Yes, <laughs> I, I, I think um, Faith in Feminism is a group that has been working with um, UN Women for a number of years, and there's quite a range of organizations that have contributed to that discussion. You can search them up. Uh, and I think there are many examples of religion or belief communities around the world where women's voice is, is heard loud and clear, that not only are they able to discuss and progress you know the challenge will be an eternal one <laughs> well not eternal <laughs> but but uh, will will be a continued one but the point is to dialogue and take steps and to address the issues uh, as as they emerge and you know we shouldn't have just women's rights champions we should also have it should shouldn't it should be irrespective of gender who is championing whose rights because we are talking about the human rights of one and all and it's up to us to ensure that that dialogue and that movement is spreading and we should go work cross boundaries in, in order to advance understanding and, and progress this. I have just received two direct messages from our participants. Uh, there are two more questions. Uh, actually, I thank you uh, very much uh, for your interest and for the questions and for excellent uh, answers, of course. Uh, now, I would like to share those questions uh, in Turkish. One question relates to the compulsory religious courses uh, in the education. And the second one uh, is on, uh, on just a minute, on, on French public law and uh, some, uh, and the use of uh, religious symbols and some uh, restrictions. Now I would like to raise the question in Turkish. Uh, Türkiye'de uygulanan zorunlu din dersleri. Uh, we have compulsory obligatory religious lessons in Turkish education system, and there are individual applications uh, made to waiver from these or compulsory education. Sometimes these applications are rejected, or individuals are uh, subjected to pressure. Families applications are rejected. What is your take on this? And maybe in the field of freedom of religion, uh, what steps can be taken to make sure students are not obliged to take that lesson? This question goes to both Nazila and Nala. So I, I personally, I never had any education, any religious education, and I don't think uh, that I am not uh, spiritual enough. So I am against any compulsory education in this field. I think the people should be looking at and reading and discovering and raised uh, in their communities, but I'm against compulsory. It's like coercion. It's like forcing them to get somewhere, um, to get the knowledge somewhere. I'm not for, uh, for these type of courses personally. Um, really, the, the experts here, uh, um, I don't know, Professor Oder, if you have written on this, but certainly Mina, Dr. Mina Yildirim has written on this, and she's the expert, and perhaps you can take this forward in more detail in future seminars. But the rule of thumb, the general observation of the Human Rights Committee in its, in its jurisprudence has been to allow opt-outs and to make sure that when it's a public school, that that education is broad-based and that still there should be opt-outs. Regarding um, religious symbols in, in public places, uh, it's, a, it's a very big issue. There's a lot of literature on it. And Mine, I suggest that maybe that can be a future seminar as well, but excellent questions. Uh, another question has been recently raised uh, by one of my colleagues, a constitutional scholar uh, from Eastern Mediterranean University Faculty of uh, Law, Demet Çelik Ulusoy. I would like to thank to organization uh, committee, particularly Nazila Gera and Nala Haidar, who contributed with valuable opinions on the topic. You mentioned, uh, friends, in terms of the freedom of religious symbols and clothing, especially in some sectors in the working life. In this context, what do you think about the separation of working life between those who receive and provide the public service, which is proposed by French public law? Because this principle focuses entirely on impartiality in the provision of public service. 
Can I defer to you, Nahla, and then come in very briefly <laughs> oh. at the end? <laughs> Well, I personally, for many years, and I still am, uh, for the separation that France had, but it became so exaggerated that it lost the spirit of it. So in principle, I am for it, but they were like abused and it became stigmatizing those who did not want to follow. So there, there has to be some reflection and France probably with all what happened in the suburbs and et cetera, must take stock and maybe reconsider some of the way of doing the split before the split, but not the, the French example is not the best. I guess we have answered all the questions and Funda Tekin has recently shared with us a very, very uh, significant report uh, published uh, by the uh, by the initiative Türkiye'de zorunlu din eğitimi, compulsory religious education uh, in Turkey. Uh, I strongly recommend this very significant report uh, and I would like to pass uh, the word to Mine Hanım. Uh, I thank you very much to our panelists. It was just a very insightful uh, panel. It is truly thought uh, provoc provoking. I thank uh, to all participants uh, and I would like to uh, share my uh, sincere uh, regards to all of you from Istanbul, from Koç University. Thank you so much. Çok teşekkürler. Son derece ilginç bir tartışma oldu. Hem ufuk açıcı hem de birçok soru da ortaya çıkan tartışmalar gerçekleşti. Ben kendi adım. We have heard a lot. I personally found it truly interesting. I would like to thank all the speakers, Dr. Ganiya and Ms. Haydar, Professor Ödar. Thank you so much for joining us. And I'd like to thank the participants for their patience and staying with us until this late hour of the evening. And we uh, hope to see you in the coming webinars. We will never stop discussing this important issue. We will have more opportunities to have further discussions. Please uh, remember to follow us through our social media accounts. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Hi. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>